An Englishman in the Balkans with a very, very special episode. In fact, it's the first of three uh, episodes that I'm going to be doing with Mark or Mark's going to be doing with me. It doesn't matter. We're going to be doing it with each other in the nicest possible way. Uh, we're going to find out a lot more about Mark and his wife uh, and what they're doing and why I have now referred to him as an Englishman um, in Croatia. But there's so much to tell in this story that um, when we were chatting before we started this episode, we decided that really we should break it into three parts. So our mini-series over the next three episodes will be... How come an Englishman arrives in Croatia and does something quite unique? Then we're going to talk about what it's like to set up a business in Croatia because there may be people both watching and listening to this that have thought, well, why don't we go and do something in Croatia? And the natural response to that, I think, normally is, that's all going to be too difficult. We'll find out whether that is difficult or not and maybe some tips and tricks on how to overcome it. And in the third episode, anecdotes about what it's like to live in Croatia. And it's going to be fun. That one's going to be really fun. They're all going to be fun, but that one's going to be equally fun because I'm sure there are a lot of similarities. Right, you've heard enough about me. But Mark Whitfield has been in Croatia for, I think, two years or maybe more. As I normally say, the most simplest and what people say is an idiotic, idiotic question I always think it's the best. So who is Mark Whitfield? You're listening to an Englishman in the Balkans. Yeah, I am. Um, well, thank you for this opportunity, David. It's uh, it's a real pleasure to spend some time with you. I'm a um, guy from the north of England. I was brought up on a farm in, in the Yorkshire Dales, left school at 15, um, and then went back to college and university and so on later in life. And eventually became a teacher and then into education management and uh, ended up in the Middle East for a, a good while working in education. I'm married to Jilly. Uh, we have two daughters who are 32 and 30, Ellie and Emma. They live in Manchester. And uh, we now live in, uh, we now, my wife and I now live in Croatia. Of all the places to be, why Croatia? I mean, you know, you've traveled, you've seen a a fair bit outside the United Kingdom. Croatia normally hits people's minds as being the place these days where you get reasonably priced Adriatic holidays. But I don't think there are too many, I might be wrong, you might tell me, um, foreigners, if I put it that way, that really explore inland. And you are inland, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why Croatia? Well, I mean, there are a few of us here, a few foreigners, uh, but not many. We live around an hour north of an hour and 15 minutes north of Zagreb, right on the uh, 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 Croatian Slovenian border. This uh, setting behind me is the village called Strigova, and uh, it's the last village before you go over into into Slovenia. Um, and, and we absolutely love it here. Um, so we considered the, the coast, but the coast is a place that's very busy in the summer and very empty in the winter. So it wasn't really what we wanted. We wanted to live in Europe after being in the Middle East. We always knew that. Um, and we wanted somewhere that, that had that kind of 365 days a year um, living, if you will. We didn't want to be somewhere that's empty in the winter and then really busy in the summer. So the, this area of Croatia was perfect for us. It's very central. If, it, if Central Europe is anywhere, it's around here. Uh, we can be anywhere uh, quite quite easily and quite readily. So um, we, as we ended our time in the Middle East, we knew that uh, we would be living somewhere in Europe. That was always always going to be uh, our ambition. Um, and we looked all over. Uh, we'd spent much of our early years as, as a married couple with our young children traveling in Europe, as you do with a camp. Uh, with a with a um, with a tent going to campsites, and um, we tended to go east uh, rather than west, if you will. We weren't really Spain and Portugal type people. We did quite a bit in France, uh, but we tended to come this way. And we spent actually quite a lot of our holidays camping in Slovenia. Actually, um, it's kind of ironic that we now live in Croatia, but that's a, that's another matter. But 
Um, so Slovenia was always something somewhere very special for us. So we were always very happy in this area. This is kind of 20 years ago. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, I was I was with some friends driving uh, driving along the, along the highway from uh, Zagreb back to Budapest after we'd had a weekend in, in Zagreb. And I just remember seeing this part of Croatia that had these little ribbons of vineyards coming down off the hills. And it just looked very quaint and beautiful and very livable, I suppose. Um, and I kind of made a mental note of that. That was in 2013. And um, so when we were seriously looking for somewhere to settle, that came back to mind. And so I started looking in this area. Um, one of the really fortunate things uh, about about looking was there was a British guy actually living in Varajdin, which is about 25 minutes south of here, married to a Croatian. And he was running a little uh, website called Rural Property Croatia, which he doesn't doesn't uh, run anymore. He's retired. But he was doing a business for people like us. He was helping us find these kind of places. So um, I think without Paul doing his job, we wouldn't be here. Nor would a few other people that we know in this area. He was doing a real service. And it's a shame that he's not doing it anymore um, because there is a lot of potential in this area. So that was that was the start of the journey for this area of Croatia. But I always, I always take it back to two other things uh, uh, in my childhood. One was as a boy, probably of 10 or 11 years old, I used to sit and listen to the radio at night, trying to tune into strange radio stations that no one else probably listened to. There was, I used to listen to Radio Moscow. Remember, this is in the 70s and probably early, early, early 80s. Um, I used to listen to Radio Moscow, which was this kind of propaganda service for the, for the Soviet government. And I used to listen to the one in East Germany. I used to listen to something called Radio Free Albania, which I think was similar for Albania. They were all English language uh, propaganda stations. And I just had this fascination for what was going on behind the wall, if you will, or behind the curtain, the Iron Curtain. Obviously, Yugoslavia was never literally part of the Iron Curtain thing. But that whole notion of what was happening in the east of, of Europe fascinated me. Um, and that was coupled with we I grew up in a in a, a, a home, a church attending home. So my parents were Methodists and we used to have these missionaries come and tell us about smuggling Bibles into East Berlin and things like that. And I was never that bothered about the Bible, but I was really fascinated by these stories of, you might say, daring do. Of, uh, and it was, again, it was, it was kind of feeding my fascination for what I saw as the East. Um, so I think I've had it since I was a small boy, really. Um, and then obviously history for me, my, my own living history is, you know, Soviet, East-West relations, fall of the Berlin Wall, and then you know, unfortunately, you know the 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 Yugoslav uh, war, the home war, as they call it in Croatia, and as you obviously in Bosnia, you you you're in an area that experienced some terrible things during that really difficult period, was something that continued my fascination to some extent. Um, although I was one of these, you know, plenty of people have said to us, Croatia isn't that war torn. You'll have had this in Bosnia. Well. If, of course, that's just a silly thing to say. Um, and, you know, it's a beautiful country with wonderful people that's done an amazing job of recovering from something that happened in the last kind of 30 years or whatever. And, and um, is, is, it certainly doesn't define Croatia as a nation in the way it doesn't define Bosnia or Serbia or Montenegro or anywhere else, really. But, um, yeah, so probably from a very young boy, had a fascination for this area or this region, if you will, going east of Europe. Um, that interest revived about 10 years ago, and then um, we started looking. And then and then just to finish that little story, I suppose, we, we bought some land not too far away from here. Uh, we thought we'll build on, on, a, on a piece of land, um, which we were going to do. And then actually this property became available. And uh, it was just too good to, it was, it was too good to, to not, uh, not purchase. It's a beautiful location in a just on the edge of a, a, a lovely living village, um, which we really love. And uh, we've still got the land if anyone wants to buy a part of Croatia, there's a piece of land there that they could have. Um, so we've still got the land, but it's, it's lying dormant at the moment. This is our home. I remember as well, many years ago, listening on Valve Radio's to what was then offshore pirate radio in, in England. And 
there were always these markers on the dial. And I got very nostalgic the other week by going out to a coffee bar here, which uh, I'll take you to as and when you come down. It's uh, the restaurant Slap, the waterfall restaurant just outside Banyaluka, where the guy there collects valve radios. I've never seen a collection of it uh, in my life before. And I thought very much uh, a view after we first spoke offline, as it were, there was a mark on it that said Ljubljana. And I too used to listen to these sounds coming in and out, you know, the static uh, and everything like that. So when I came to Bosnia, I had a certain feeling, and I wonder what it was like for you. Those perceptions of what was on the other side of not here, obviously, in, in the former Yugoslavia, not behind the wall, but certainly strong socialism, uh, which we both were not, um, had never been exposed to. I certainly hadn't been exposed to it. So when you, you came to Croatia and you actually see it for what it is, what was your feeling from thinking, well, I'm not too far away from Ljubljana, from Slovenia, and, well, what I used to listen to and the history that I studied. When you arrived in the reality where there is no war, like you and I both get asked all the time, it gets boring now, but you have to cope with it. What was, what, what was it like when you finally put the boots on terra firma and you're looking around and over your shoulder there, there is this quaint church, it's, it's quintessentially churches, rural Balkanism, it's, isn't it, really? We have two here. <laughs> two churches. One of, the, one of the, I think, a fairly rare, rare, rare site, right. actually, are, are, those, are those two churches, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what's it been like um, from those perceptions as a younger man, listening to things and now living in that perception that you had? I think the perception changes over the years, doesn't it? So, you know, I suppose why was I fascinated by those early, uh, you know, early uh, delves into into those kind of propaganda radio stations and so on? Because I was maybe it was because I was somebody who who was always interested in the other side of the story, um, and I think I still am to some extent that kind of person. And I think it was one of the fascinating things when we started travelling to this region uh, on holiday. We used to love it. We used to drive to Slovenia and we'd drive for two weeks around Slovenia and never see another British car. And it's not that I'm anti my own country, but I just like to be in somewhere where you, you know, uh, you, you didn't you didn't encounter a kind of British expat community. So that was that was always interesting for us. And and the other thing about about um, traveling to um, Slovenia was it, it was the start of that looking at it physically from another perspective. So if you drive over the Versic Pass, for example, which takes you from Kranska Gora over to Bovets, the Socha River is a beautiful, I don't know whether you've ever been there, David, but it's just, um, it's, it's, the river is the same color as some of those lakes you get in uh, Bosnia that I know I've, I've visited and are beautiful, that rich green, uh, bluey green color. So the Socha River is beautiful. And, and, and as you go over the Versic Pass to come down into Bovets and into the Socha Valley, uh, you pass a Russian, uh, a Russian church, and I think graveyard there as well is with the church, maybe slightly separate. But it's it's from the First World War, and you realise that you're you're looking at a war from a different front, which I think is you start to see something different. And then we went uh, rafting down the Socha River, which is obviously an exciting trip. But at the same time, the guy who who took us and our girls were only small at the time, but. He was telling us all about the history, and actually, Ernest Hemingway's uh, Farewell to Arms was was written uh, around there in the, uh, I think it was the Isonzo Front, and he was showing us all the pack mule tracks and things where the weapons had been taken in as we went down this river. So actually, I think you you start to see this part of the world from a different perspective anyway, and and this was all post the Home War, the Yugoslav War, obviously post the the 1989 and everything that happened around then. So you're hearing this, you're, you're hearing a narrative of today. You're hearing what people are feeling like living here. Uh, well, that was in Slovenia, and and at the same time, you're you're discovering a different history, I suppose. And I think I would say complementing that were regular trips to um, Budapest, uh, Krakow, 
we we took our girls when they were very small to Auschwitz, you know, and Birkenau, and, and now our friends were like, you're crazy. Why do you take your kids to a something that's so sad? Well, you take them to something like that because it's more important than taking them to Disneyland, although my kids at the time uh, may have disagreed with us. So as I worked in education, I used to do Erasmus exchange. I used to organize Erasmus exchanges. And so, again, just my natural leaning towards the East meant that I was arranging for me to be able to travel and work in Budapest for short periods or Krakow or uh, places in, in what what is Central Europe, what was dis- what was then felt like was the East of Europe. Um, so I think my understanding of this world that I now live in was probably not, there wasn't a kind of like jumping in at the deep end. It was formed over those years. Um, and then living, a, living in the Middle East, you meet everyone. In the Middle East, there's expats from everywhere. So you, you, it kind of, if you've got any stereotypes about different people or cultures, then you know, living in the Middle East is a good place to break those down. Um, so when we came here, I don't think there was too much shock for us. The biggest shock here is that people here say, "How on earth did two British people come and live in Medjimoria, which is the the area? No one would do that. Why would you do that?" And it's and it's a bit of a shock for Croatians to hear that we're here rather than a shock for us to be here. We found that people here very warm, very friendly, uh, very supportive, right from as we were searching. Um, and we kind of had to narrow down the geography of where we were going to live. And eventually we found this part of Medjimoria, which is uh, Gorni Medjimoria, Upper Medjimoria. And um, some people describe it and call it Little Switzerland. It's a kind of certain area of uh, the, the county that's just beautiful. Um, a lot of the people from around here for years have travelled to Austria and Germany to work and so on. It's only 30 kilometres from here to um, Austria, just through the sh- narrowest part of Slovenia. So it's very well kept. It's, 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 uh, the houses are well looked after. You know, there are parts of Croatia which are, are, are less developed. So the people here are quite forward thinking, although they might not see themselves as that. Um, so we we settled really nicely and easily. I liked uh, the way that you were describing people being amazed at why you have ended up where you have ended up. And why would you ever want to come here? Because there's nothing here. I, I'm assuming that's what they're saying, because I experienced that, um, yeah, at least twice or two or three times a week, somebody is saying, you know, when they realize who I am, uh, why did you come here? Of all the places uh, you've come here. And I think I've got some ready-made answers to that, which is this is where I feel my happiest. uh, And I actually like the way of life here. Uh, And I try to explain to them that, you know, where they live, for me, and it is my own my own realization with all the the dysfunctionality that I have to live in. I still feel that this is a a really good place to be, and it seems that you have the same view. How do you respond briefly to to somebody when you're walking outside your coffee bar, or you know you're going to the apotheque, you're going to the chemist, or whatever, and somebody says? A Brit, what, what, why here? What, what is your answer that, that, that rolls uh, off your tongue? Or do you have to stand and go, oh, my God, here we go the, again? The, my, my first answer is why not here? Um, that's my first answer. And it's a little bit of a kind of probably a delaying tactic because I really don't know um, what what to tell them. I mean, it's interesting when when I'm somewhere where my Croatian isn't good enough to get by. They'll. I remember one guy pointing at the car and saying, your wife is from Croatia, you know, uh, and I'm like, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> she, she's also uh, uh, English. And I think um, I think Croatians I, are quite used to a, a trailing spouse, if you will. So there'll be a Croatian woman whose husband, there's a guy who lives down in Chakovets here. Um, he's, he's a Brit and he met his Croatian wife in uh, Los Angeles. I think they both lived and worked and now they've come back and they're bringing their kids up in Croatia. So there are people like him, like you with Tamara, you know, I mean, I don't, Jilly and I are both Northern UK re- people and we, we happen to be here on our own. Um, I, I think my answer is not understood, but I think, so number one, flippantly, I will say, why not? 
Number two, I will always say that we were always destined to, I think, live in Europe rather than going back to the UK for reasons related to weather and potentially politics, I suppose, with Brexit and so on. Um, there was all kinds of reasons why we, we would probably always want to live in Europe. And then we were open to wherever in Europe, really. I was always probably going to try and go as far east as I could before Jilly said that's too far east. Um, and we found, I think, the, the Goldilocks spot, if you will, uh, in, in terms of the place to live. So um, Europe is, is another aspect uh, we were always going to live in Europe. I think the other thing I, 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 I think I learned, I think we've learned this and I think I've learned it over the two years that we've been here. There's lots to love about the lifestyle here. And I'm talking about the quality of life rather than, um, than any notion of how much money you've got or what kind of car you've got or any of those kind of things. Now, Maybe Bosnia is, is similar, I think, because there's lots of people have left Bosnia to go and have a better life in Germany and so on, and, and it's happened here. And people here suffer from that those friends of theirs that now live in Germany and drive an Audi and, and have a big house and then come back here every summer and tell their friends how wonderful it is and how well off they are. And it makes those here feel, I think, uh, belittled by that to some extent or lessened by that. But I tell them that in terms of having a quality life, there is nowhere like this. I mean, maybe Bosnia, but the, you know, the people here still live by the rhythm of nature almost. I mean, the bells go at six o'clock here and basically wake the village up and say, go to work. And, you know, 7 a.m. is rush hour here, not 9 a.m. or whatever it is in the UK, 8 or 9 a.m. People are finishing by two because then they go home and they work in, you know, they're, I mean, I'm being slightly stereotypical. I know this is not I know this is even dying, but this, you know, the idea of people still grow their own vegetables, still raise a few chickens or a pig or a cow. Uh, they've got their own crop of corn or just some of that connection to nature, I think, is 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 really nice for me coming from a farming background. Um, and I actually what I do, to be honest with you, David, I describe it as a progressive society because of that. They see it as something that means they're 30 years behind all these progressive societies in North and Europe, you know, where. Uh, but I actually see these as things that many Northern Europeans would love to go back to, where life was a little bit simpler, where family was just as important as it is here, where your connection to nature is still quite strong, where the rhythm of life goes with the rhythm of nature, like you and your making sausages or baking rakia or, or bottling your peppers and things that I've enjoyed watching on your videos over the last five or six years, whatever. They're all part of the rhythm of the nature of life in this region. And um, I love that. We've lost it in, I think, most of the kind of northern European countries. Yeah, I would I would certainly agree. Do you think that you've actually started in the two years that you've been where you've been, where you are now? Are you getting into the, do you feel the start of that rhythm um, taking over in your life? Uh, slowly. I think um, we, uh, we, we talk about this a lot, actually. We talk about feeling like it's okay not to do something, not to be busy all the time. You know, we've we've lived a pretty busy life over the last 20 years, I suppose. Um, so having, feeling like you've got time is something that is very much a Croatian thing, very much a Balkan thing anyway. So for example, I went to get my car serviced at, in Varajdin and um, a friend of mine, Marco, said, we'll, we'll meet for coffee. So he came and picked me up from the uh, car place and uh, we just parked and we walked to a coffee shop. We had a coffee. He called a couple of friends. These friends came to visit him. We drank coffee. We then walked from that coffee shop to another coffee shop. We had all the time between me dropping the car off and picking it up. It was about three and a half hours. And we just drank coffee for three and a half hours. And he was used to it. He's a relaxed guy. He's, he's a night. He, he works a night shift. So this was during the day and this was spending time with his friends, spending time with other friends, coming to the coffee shop. Um, I think as it got towards about 11 o'clock, we probably had a beer as well. Um, but I was almost getting anxiety from doing nothing. You can't, I was like, I can't just sit and do nothing. Um, but we are learning, and it's taking time, we are learning to do less. And we are learning that it's it's okay. I, I think in, in, Debr uh, in Dalmatia, I think they call it pomelo, means take it easy a different pace so we're learning to have that and actually you know that kind of Protestant work ethic in me 
is that you should be working hard all the time and striving and busy and busy and busy. And actually, it's great to get rid of some of that. It's great for your stress levels. Although I'm not sure drinking as much coffee as we do is good for your stress levels. <laughs> yeah, in Bosnia, they're the word that they use because of the Turkish influence here, strong Turkish influence for, you know, 500 years nearly. Um, they have the word, word chafe. Uh, you know, you have your chafe, and, and chafe is like kicking back, but it's kicking back on steroids. You know what I mean? For, as far as a Northern European is concerned, and I think for me, um, after all the years I've been here, I still have the. You know, when I'm doing nothing for the day, why should I be doing anything? There's no reason. David, calm down. And I'm talking to myself. I still get those guilt feelings. And when I express that, everybody around me says, you're gloop, you're stupid, you know, why? Just just, just don't do anything. Put your legs up on the sofa, enjoy the sun. Um, and I still, I, I, yeah, I am getting used to it, but it, it is taking um, a, a bit of time. As far as being where you are in this small community, can you just describe, you know, your your local town or your local large village uh, over your shoulder where they, those two quaint churches are? What exactly have you got as the infrastructure to support you? I lived in a, before I came to Bosnia and Herzegovina, I was living in a village in South Oxfordshire, which I thought was small, which was 6,000 people. My municipality here has got 6,500 people, so goodness knows what, and we had everything. Um, in that village. I now live in a village and we don't have, we have a, a kiosk. What else do we have? Um, we have a small con half container, which is a, uh, a lady's hairdressing salon. What else have we got? Somewhere where you can buy plants, uh, flowers to go to the graveyard. What else? That's about it. So what have you got? I mean, you look over the shoulder and you think, ah, what's behind those, uh, those vines that you're sat in front of. Um, so what have you got? What what have you actually downsized from the Middle East? Yeah, well, to so that, where that's you are? A, and it is an interesting downsize. So we, you know, we li living in the Middle East is a very kind of anybody who's done it knows it's a. So we had a great time. This is not a negative on living in Abu Dhabi or Bahrain or or the place we've lived. But there's a certain amount of fakery to that. Not not that the people are fake or anything. I'm not making any judgment. Just you know, it's the mall. It's it's um it's it's air conditioning you know the weather extremes mean that it controls your life um bahrain is a little bit more kind of earthy than than abu dhabi but when we came here one of the things we were coming for is this this greenery this natural environment um and and again what the only exp the experience we've got is what we've got here and i've spoken to other croatians who say mark if you go to slavonia or if you go to other parts of uh, of croatia outside of outside of Medjimoria and especially uh, this part of Medjimoria, it's not like this. So I accept that it's a limited view, but we've got two churches, one of which the pink one here uh, is a working church, very much part of the community. The vicar lives just uh, just there. You can see the top of his roof of his house just here. Uh, the other church is a church that's, um, it's not used. The bells still ring every now and again, but um, it's not used, but it's got some very interesting frescoes by a, by a Italian artist, and so people visit for that. Uh, up on the hill up here, there's a there's a viewing tower that looks down over the whole area. Um, this is the highest point in Medjimoria, and um, there's a wine bar up there where you can buy local wine. Apparently, Strigova has got more vineyards per square mile than anywhere else in the world. So it's got lots of small vineyards. Um, the wine producers are, are incredibly uh, productive and popular, but they're not big. So they always, they're all their wine, their wine rarely leaves uh, uh, Croatia. Uh, it's beautiful, white wines, some red, but mostly white wines, and it's wonderful. So I'm, I'm, we're surrounded by uh, vineyards and wineries where you can go and taste the wine and so on, and that's a really nice part of living here. But infrastructure-wise, we have a... A restaurant in the village, just a minute away from the church. We've got four coffee bars, and you know what I mean by that: coffee and beer and water. Pretty much what the and said Vita. I don't know whether you have that where you are. Um, are in this is four coffee bars. There are three supermarkets, 
uh, one of which a consum opened in in the last year. So we've actually increased the number of supermarkets in the last year. We have a a, a hair salon, a Frizerski. We have a post office. We have a dentist. We have a doctor's. We have a petrol station. Um, what am I missing? We just that's that's probably it. But I mean, there's just lots of it down here, um, and it's all within a four minute walk probably from where I'm sat. So it's re the infrastructure is amazing and probably only two or three thousand people I would say. I don't know the number, I should have looked it up. But um it's an incredible infrastructure. But then, you know, as people say, there's no bus service. So what would the old people do? They can't go anywhere to get their food. So it needs to be local for them and so on. So there are reasons maybe why, you know, because public transport's pretty limited. So maybe that's why we have such good service. But it's a it's definitely what you would call a living village. I'm going to be doing a podcast in in the not too distant future talking about healthcare in um in Bosnia Herzegovina and especially in the northern part. Um you know my story maybe lots of people don't but I had a serious break of my ankle uh some time ago and I was exposed to what I thought was going to be very backward very primitive uh healthcare and found the whole uh, experience totally it shocked me it was it was that good i'm not going to give you any spoilers but um the other person i'm talking to gave birth here she's also a foreigner and i i think that would be a very good topic for people to learn a little bit more of the backstory of bosnia herzegovina but um how have you found being a rural person now in croatia uh, I'm a rural person in, in, in a neighbouring country. Um, whilst they are similar, there are differences between Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Have you had reason to use the health service? And if so, you know what has your experience been? Because when people think about where they're going to move, I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, but that's on the back seat. They want to think about what their property is going to be like and all the rest. These other things, healthcare seem to, creep out of the woodwork you never really planned for it and then something happens like me I broke my leg and then it's oh now what do I do so have you got any experiences of of, of that in Croatia here during the kind of we bought the place during the covid pandemic so we had to we were living in Bahrain and we had to buy it all via power of attorney from Bahrain because we couldn't travel here um but when we actually moved here in July 21 it was still around towards the tail end of there were still restrictions and there was still need to go and have a booster jab if you were going to have a jab. And we were going to have a, a jab because it's the only way we could travel. <coughs> um, so our first experience was going for a booster jab for 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 um, for COVID, which was just very easy. Just go to the local hospital and there was an, and COVID tests as well. You just went to the local hospital. None of that kind of privatization of it in the UK where everybody's mates seem to be making millions from setting up COVID test centers on industrial parks and things. It was all part of the local hospital. We paid. And so at least I suppose the, the money was going to the to the local hospital. So that was our first experience. We got residency here. And as when you get residency here, you have to pay a kind of national insurance type deal to get access to the healthcare. It's not expensive. Um, and we, we've got that. And uh, well, it's it's interesting again. This is just comparing to the UK, and rather than rather than comparing to the Middle East, where we had private healthcare and everything's paid for, and it's all very swish and everything in places like Dubai and Abu Dhabi. But um, we we were given a list of doctors, and we said we were told we could choose one. It didn't really matter somewhere in Medjimoria, we could choose a doctor. So we asked a friend of ours, and she said the doctor in Strigova is a, a, a young man, well liked. So we said, well, we'll sign up with the local doctor then. That's no problem. So we, we had to fill in a form, took it down there, signed up with the doctor. Now, of course, we don't want to be in a situation where we need the doctor. But I think it was last, in the winter sometime, I started to get this sore throat and it got into my chest. And I was thinking, I'm, I'm the kind of person who never goes to the doctor. And I just thought, if this becomes pneumonia or something, I'm in tr- you know, I could be in trouble. And I just I thought, I need to get it checked out. Now, this is, of course, when you're hearing on the news that if you call a doctor in the UK, you can't get a reply. And if you do, your appointment's either by telephone or in three weeks' time. I just walked down into the village. I can see the doctors from the other side of the house. I just walked down into the village, went in, 
and the the young lady receptionist in the doctors speaks great English. And uh, I said, I've just got this, you know, I kind of gave my symptoms. I'm just not, you know, I'm, I think I need to make an appointment. She said, hang on a minute. And she said, just wait five minutes. And the patient came out from our doctor. I walked in. He looked at it. He said, Mark, you're just going to have to, he's again, great English. He said, you're just going to have to let it work its way through. You don't need anything. It's fine. I said, right, great. That's all I needed to know. And I walked out. And what more What more could you want? Um, the, in Chakovets, there's a big hospital, which friends of ours have had to access for various things and have always seemed to have had good service. Uh, including a, one friend who had some quite serious stuff going on and, and seemed like you, felt like the service was great. The other thing I like about here is if you, there is a private healthcare service here that is affordable to people like me. So I accept that some Croatians would see, you know, 200 euros for an ultrasound to be way too expensive for them. And I understand that, but, you know, like um, we had a reason to, to, to require a little bit of uh, a little bit of care, and we just went we just went to the private clinic and paid what was next at 150 euros or something. Whereas in the UK it'd probably been a couple of thousand, and I think that's a problem for the UK because people who could afford to access private healthcare in the UK can't because it's so out of reach. Whereas here you've got the standard of healthcare is pretty good anyway. We've never had a problem with it, but actually not far above in terms of affordability. You've got private healthcare; it's not out of reach. So that's really helpful as well, uh, having that that private private healthcare uh, if you can afford it, and if and if you, I suppose, if we use the private healthcare, it's it's not placing us as a burden on the on the public system, which we have, of course are also paying for, and which we would use normally. But if you just want something that's defined and quick, and you feel like you can afford it, then private healthcare isn't silly either in terms of price. No, for me, it's 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 been well within budget. Although people say, "Well, you're living in a country that has got a lower um, standard of living to the UK," which is true. Um, you know, I have my UK state pension, and I also have a very small military pension. People think military pensions are large, but the reality is, it's not. And I couldn't live in the UK um, with with a reasonable life. I'd have to be working even now, um, but here I can. Um, and, and I feel very grateful for that. But even so, with Croatia, which is a good few notches up on the quality of life from where I am, I think, do you, do you, I sometimes get this feeling that crazily that I'm better off, not financially, but I'm a lot better off in many other ways here than I would be back in the United Kingdom, do you feel that at all, or do or do you, or, or do you feel that sometimes there's a, oh, I wish I was back in in the UK. Uh, I have no desire to be back in the UK. Uh, we we have our two daughters and and um, we miss them obviously. And but there's a Ryanair flight from Zagreb, which is only an hour and a quarter away, from uh, Zagreb to to Manchester. So it's not difficult for us to get to get back to get back to the UK should we wish to. Um, no, I mean I I. In terms of quality of life, there's no comparison. In you know, the weather here is better. Um, we we enjoy the food. There are certain things we miss, but not really. Um, we miss variety in in the restaurants. You know, we we can't go down to our local Indian takeaway here. Um, but it doesn't mean the food's bad here. You just don't have the same choice. Um, so no, I think I think there are lots of reasons why we feel living here is um, is a much better quality of life. We've done the maths. And I, you know, with all of our uh, expenditure, including all of our insurances that we pay, all of our ha everything we have to pay, house insurance, car insurance, running a car, um, we don't have a mortgage on the house. Um, so there's no loans of any sort like that. But basically our life here, including food, petrol and everything else is done on a thousand pounds, maybe 1200 euros a month um for two of us now and that we don't skimp on our living either and we eat lots of nice food and so on but so so of course you couldn't live on on that kind of money in the uk it would be crazy to try um so yeah definitely the quality of life here is 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 better than in the uk without a doubt i'm not going to give any secrets away now and we're going to talk about the negative sides because there will be a few negative sides in 
in episode three, but you're not on holiday. You have a business. And as I alluded to in, in, in the lead up that, you know, we're going to talk in the next episode about what it's like um, in the Western Balkans, because I think the bureaucracy of Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina in particular are similar. So it's going to be interesting as we, we go through that. But you have a business um, and a very unusual business, I think. And I've talked to uh, a lot of uh, people that I mix with and I've, I've been showing them your website and, you know, your Instagram channel and everything. And they're going, what, 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 what? And who's an Englishman doing this? Uh, and I said, yes. So you, you are in the glamping business. The, I think glamping is a combination of glamour and camping, which when I sat down and uh, after we talked offline and I thought, hang on, I'm trying to get a line of logical thought between running a glamping business and having been a teacher. You know, the, acad the academia of it, yeah, I get that. Being out and doing glamping, I get that. But how did this come together? And we'll talk about it in, in the next episode, but how, how exciting or how terrifying has it been to set that sort of business up in this wonderful area surrounded by vineyards where you are? Um, it's, it's a really good question. And I think there's, there's part of me wants to say that if you knew – what you know now, you ask yourself the question, would you have done it um, uh, uh, again? And, and, you know, when you think about the money we've invested or looking at it from any angle, you could, you could very easily say, well, you'd have been better off not doing it. You could easily say that if all it does is cost you, you know, £12,000 a year to live there anyway, why would you invest a load of money in something and then have to, re, re, you know, f get a return on that? Um We'll we'll talk about the technicalities of, of of opening a business and running a business, but I would so just very generally, we we knew this was always a lifestyle business. It was never a business to make a million or anything. We're not interested. It was always a lifestyle business. Um, we wanted to do something that connected us with the community. Uh, we know that the you know Croatia is becoming uh, known as a place for digital nomads to come and work and that's great and and you know there are lots of people doing lots of interesting things in croatia for us we wanted something that connected us with that community down behind us uh, as soon as you start opening a business like this here you get noticed uh, we've been on tv we've been in the newspapers i mean you just you could google us and find uh, articles and films we've got people coming and filming tomorrow again from a local newspaper they just have that, why on earth? Why would you do this? That's the questions and the same answers come. Um, for us, it was connecting us to the community. It was giving us something to keep us busy. It was doing something very different from what we've done before. Um, we've built relationships with the local mayor in the town, the local tourism. Uh, when, we, when we're in the town, I went to buy some uh, bedding plants for some pots we've got near the swimming pool. And uh, the lady I was buying them off who spoke English, said, oh, I saw you on TV. <laughs> she knew who we were. <laughs> it's just like she doesn't even live here. You know, she's from somewhere else. So we've, it's really, I mean, probably more than we feel comfortable with, actually. We've kind of become a little bit uh, known. Not famous, just known. Um, and we're not that bothered about that, really. But we are interested in being connected to the local community. So, so having the business has done that for us. Uh, we think this is a beautiful part of the world. We've had people from Netherlands, Belgium, uh, around Croatia, UK, Slovenia, and no one comes and says, why on earth do you live here? You know, I mean, we've had people come and say, are you selling this place? Because we'd love it. You know, you know the type of, you know, uh, these passionate travellers who come and find this little uh, pocket of uh, beauty and love it. So, yeah, all sorts of really positive reasons for doing it. Uh, we were happy to invest a certain amount of money in it, which is what we've done. Um and we just keep working hard to try and make it successful. And the downside is people don't know what glamping is. And, you know, when you when you come to, especially locally, you know, and you come to stay in a glamping tent, you're actually, it's like a five-star hotel in one of those tents. You've seen the, you've seen the pictures. Jilly dresses them beautifully and there's the pool and there's a beautiful kitchen in the barn and it's not camping by any means. Um, 
But I think there's a more utilitarian mindset maybe amongst a lot of Croatians, which is that if you go away, you get a bed for the night. And nor is it just a bed for the night. It's an experience. I mean, waking up with the birds singing or the clock, uh, the, the church bells ringing and there's, it's more than a bed for the night. And I think there is quite a utilitarian attitude in Croatia to being, if you go away, you go away for a bed for the night. And actually what we think we're selling is an experience. So it'll take some time, but we've got time. We're in no hurry. Of all the guests that you've had at the moment, and you know you were alluding there, there's people from the Netherlands and, uh, and, and outside Croatia, and you've actually had Croatians um, yourself. And I know that when I speak to people from the country that I'm in, whilst they will take breaks within their own their own country, mainly because they can't afford to go where they want to go, you know, like even going to the Croatian coast for a Bosnian is it, it's expensive, but it's you know it's no cigar when it goes to, to like to Paris. They simply cannot afford afford that, and they they and they and when they're in their own country, they can be I think overly critical of the wonders and the beauty and the experience that they have on their doorstep. Do you find that with Croatians as well? That why do I want to go and glamp when you know what what is this? Because Balkan people to me are conservative with a small c. Is that the same where you where you are? I, I think probably similar to to what you see in Bosnia, and that is, I mean, the Croatians all even around here they talk about. They either talk about going to the coast, depends on their language, English language, because I hear it in English, or going to the sea. If they're going to the sea, you know exactly what they mean. You know, there's this there's this exodus to the coast, which um, is something which uh, is is absolutely in the Croatian psyche, um, and for good reason. You've been, you, I've seen you, you know, I've seen your your uh, vodcasts from there. It's beautiful. The, the Croatian coastline is beautiful. You know, there's a reason why in the 70s and 80s, Yugo Tours did such a good uh, trade in the UK, you know, selling people those holidays down into Yugoslavia. And, and it was that meant the coast, didn't it? Really didn't need much else, a little bit of Slovenia, but mostly it was the coast. So there's a complete psyche about going to the coast. And we are, this area is, is waking up as a tourist destination, but it's not a mass tourist destination and probably won't be for a long time. But I think there is a recognition of a, you know, I think we do. We are part of that kind of get back to nature type um, vibe that is taking root in in Croatia, as well as around the world. And and I think people people come here and they can have Wi Fi and everything. I'm not saying it isn't it isn't a modern experience, but they can also just chill and and have time. And we've had couple. There was a couple, a lovely couple, came from Netherlands last year for a week, and they had all kinds of plans to do all kinds of things. Honestly, they hardly moved from the from the place because they just wound down and rested. And so we kind of feel like we're offering something that's quite special. I think the area offers something quite special. So we just sell that. Uh, but yeah, Croatians, generally speaking, will come here for an experience and enjoy it. But the, the coast is in their mindset. It's it's the coast is strong as a holiday destination for Croatians. It's, it certainly is. But I got the feeling, and I was talking to Tamara about it, and she said, um, do you think Mark's a trailblazer when it comes to doing things different? Because within the region, uh, they seem to look at what somebody else does. You know, For example, with glamping in, in Croatia, it would be the Brits doing it. We've got to watch him for a few years, see if he fails. And if he doesn't, man, we're jumping on that train. We're jumping on that train, and hopefully we'll keep up with him. Is is that a fair assumption? I, I think there's a. I think there could be a bit of that. Yeah, I think um, there could be. I, I, don't, I don't think. I think that's one of the things. Like earlier, when I said, you know, if we know what we knew now, would we still do it? I think we still would, but we'd probably not be so romantic about how we we thought. You know, they build it and they will come type thing, you know, and we've done pretty good social media. We've got pretty good exposure. We've got a fairly decent website. We've got our own booking system, all that kind of stuff. We've done everything that we think we can do bar, you know, throwing thousands and thousands and thousands at marketing, for example. But we've done everything. Do we, we do it all ourselves. I wrote the website. I, you know, we just do it ourselves. And we've done everything pretty much right. Um, 
But I think we were naive. I think we thought that means that people would just go, wow, that looks amazing. Let's go and experience it. I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think it will come. And I think as it comes, yeah, Croatians, there will be Croatians who have this idea. You can go glamping on the coast. But again, glamping's an interesting term. You know, for us, it's about being in the national natural environment. So we've got tents and they're, they're beautiful and everything. But then if you go to some places on the coast, the glamping, they're actually just caravans without wheels and they've made them look like a kind of cabin type thing. And it's got air con inside and very small bedroom and a, and a galley kitchen type thing. That's not glamping. It's just been marketed as glamping. So it's a kind of confused market as well, I think. But we're the only one in this area doing it. Um, and there's a there's a fairly there's a developing uh, holiday home offer here that's got some fairly low budget apartment type stuff uh, available, but then it's also got some quite nice high end uh, holiday homes with with a swimming pool and so on, but not that many. Um, we've got a pool, we've got a sauna, you know, we've got the kind of things that people enjoy. So yeah, maybe people will follow us. We'll see in a, in a couple of years, I think. We'll talk more about the business in episode two um, uh, and dig deeper into that. But I was just thinking to myself about what you said earlier about um, prior to coming here and, and being uh, in the past in environments where there were all these expat communities and, you know, you're not really into the British expat sort of scene like, like I am. I like to keep away from it. And then you mentioned about how Jilly's doing a, a lot. She dresses your you, the, the accommodation that you offer beautifully and everything. Um, but people miss things, you know, like they miss coffee mornings. Um, they miss going to the pub and stuff. Things that we would say would be quintessentially English or British. Um, and there you are five minutes walk from the village does what the village in the region your near region offer you compensate for that or do you and jilly sometimes think we, we oh i just wish we i wish we could have a dinner party like we used to have with the food that we used to have do you do you have those moments um yeah i i think living as an expat in the middle east you get used to this you know you're there's thousand i mean basically you know i don't know Nine, no, 70% of Abu Dhabi, I think, are expats who live there. And that's Indian, Bangladeshi, Southeast Asian, as well as as well as well Americans, Brits and Canadians and so on. So you, you, we're just used to being part of an expat community, but we never really, I mean, we, we made friends in that community. We never really did the whole big groups of expat things. But um, here, we have a few friends around who are, who are Brits, who are the only other Brits. And they're lovely people, so we get on well with them, and that's very fortunate. And and so we meet up with them now and again, and we have dinner with them, and we do things like that. We've also made friends with Croatians. Uh, the first, it's a, a nice story, actually. They, we've been here maybe a week, and we went to a, a restaurant down in a Chakovets. It's a grill, uh, kind of grill, barbecue grill type restaurant. Lovely place. And uh, the waiter, young young guy, came and. Uh, so we were English and said, oh, we just moved here um, and we're living in Strigo. And he said, oh, my parents have got a place in Bamfi, which is just a, up behind here, uh, a small sort of hamlet, really, we would call it. He went off and got our drinks and came back and he said, "We've uh, I've spoken to my mum and dad. After you've had dinner here, you're going to see them. And like, where would that happen? You know, so we, uh, Vlad and Nina live just up behind us here and we met them and they're a lovely couple. We had drinks with them and we went the next night as well, and so we've been really welcomed, and we've got we've got other good Croatian friends. We're going to a Croatian wedding this this summer with our friends Marco and Ivana, which is we're really looking forward to. Um, but our Croatian is so terrible, and language learning is a is not a something I'm good at, and we haven't spent enough time doing it, and it's our one Achilles heel, I suppose, and one area where we feel like we have failed ourselves as much as failed Croatia. Um, mixing isn't that easy. And also, Croatia is not a closed community, but people have their lives. And, you know, life goes on, doesn't it, without these two Brits moving into the area. So life life for people goes on. I think I don't – I'm not as probably impacted as Jilly is. 
I think for Jilly, she got used to in expat life and even before we, we moved away from the UK, having that circle of female friends, you know, the girls, you know, go out for, I'm sure Tamara does it, you know, goes out for drinks with the girls, goes out and has a coffee with the girls, goes to whatever, you know, that kind of, that kind of, uh, thing that I think is really important for for some people, especially women, maybe, I don't know, but I, it's not something that bothers me, but for Jilly, she misses that. So she doesn't have that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, obviously missing the kids as well. So, Jilly sometimes will fly back to Manchester for a week. She did a couple of weeks ago without me and uh, spend a lot of time with our two daughters and catch up with a few friends and things and sort of feeds that that need for that kind of tribe, I suppose you might say, that, that she doesn't get here. But, I mean, we kind of accept she doesn't get it here to some extent. We don't try and overforce that. That's just the nature of being here. And we find ways, ways to manage it and... Uh, She's found, I think she's found a Pilates class in Chakovets to go to, which is something she always did when we were abroad and she enjoys. So she'll start going to that and that'll get her into another group of probably predominantly women. So, you know, I'm, you just work around it. You don't, there's no point worrying about it. Um, you just, you just manage it. You are incredibly passionate about what you're doing. Um, and you can see that from the way that, the way that you are at the moment and the way that um, you're talking. Um, we're going to round off. We've been doing this nearly an hour. Do you know that? And we, we've barely scratched the surface, but <laughs> it does. Um, but in the next episode, I think we're going to dive deeper into what it's like for you having, whether you've had a massive bureaucr bureaucratic nightmare in setting this up, the setbacks that you've had, um, ways of doing things that you most probably never thought you would do that we'll be looking at this in episode two. And for people that are watching the video version of this, um, you're going to see that we're, maybe the setting might change. And the reason being for that, so that you know when you watch these, and we're going to uh, wait a few weeks till we publish these so that you can binge watch it. You can go from episode to episode to episode. Um Mark and I, as I said, decided that we should do this in bite-sized chunks. I know an hour is hardly a bite size, but it's bite-sized chunks so that you can dip in and out of uh, whatever you want. So the next time that you both hear us or see us, um, we might sound that we're in a different place. You might see the background being in a different place. Uh, it might not be the church, so don't get worried about that. But finally, for this episode, Mark, um, how is it, how is the season going for you? I know that your business season runs, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, May to September. Um, we've, we've, we've not had the usual Western Balkan season. We've, we've been going from dry to wet to dry to wet, which we've never experienced in years. Um, um, and you know, you, you heard me saying, uh, when we've chatted privately, that the Rakia this year, if we get even 200 litres, that's going to be like amazing. You know, we normally make a lot more than that. So where you are, is 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 the season going well or are you marginally disappointed because of the weather? Last We, we, we opened last year, and we'll talk more about this next next time, but last year we got open for like middle of the middle of July. So we only had the rest of July and then August and, and a little bit into September. But then September was wet last year. And so September was pretty much dead. Uh, so basically we had six weeks. And in that six weeks, we, we were 70% occupied, which we felt was really good first time out. Um, this year has been quieter than we would have hoped. Um, but like you said, I mean, the winter was wetter than the winter before. March and April were like, it was like being back in the UK. It was crazy. And um, so our that time where you're hoping that people are feeling like they want to go and try something like this, um, I think that spoiled it. And then to be honest, I mean, it's grey today. It's about 20 degrees. Yesterday it was around 28, 30. Um, but we haven't had those long periods of settled hot weather that we had last year or in our first year when we came. So the, I think the unsettled weather hasn't helped us. I think 
I think the cost of living in Croatia has really put people under a little bit this year. I think uh, the change to the euro and then inflation has made made that difficult. We're we we we're, we're in contact with other people who run glamping businesses, and it's quiet for them too. So I think it's a quiet year. Uh, probably something to do with cost of living. Probably something to do with the weather. Um, but we're not going to uh, we're not going to worry too much about that. We I keep we keep everywhere beautiful. We've got some people coming in relatively soon uh to stay so we're ready for them to come and yeah we just we just i mean you talk about me being positive or enthusiastic we just remain we just remain pretty steadfast in uh positive about it and we expect july and august to be relatively busy i think um but the season probably isn't going to be as long as we we hoped it would be well my fingers are crossed for you um i think that's it i think that's it for this episode, I'm really looking forward to when we when we record the next one because yeah, we can. I'm not saying it's going to be a serious episode, but I think it will be because it's it's if you want to come to the Western Balkans, we're going to look at Croatia being like um, the the study, if you will, uh, the case study um, to find out what it's like once the glamour of it all has sunk in that oh i'm in a different country and i want to start a business what it's like here for those of you that are thinking of coming to the western balkans i think it's going to be a must listen to episode um if nothing else you'll get the reality check but i think the bonus on offer will be some tips and tricks although mark might not say they're tips and tricks but i think when you learn from other people's experiences um it, it it will either make you say no, I ain't going to do it, or yeah, I'm going to do do it. You didn't have any people to give you tips and tricks, did you? you this is a school of hard knocks. Yeah, for you, to some extent, but I think what we did have were, and we'll talk about this uh, next time. We had some amazing advocates who, uh, local Croatian, uh, our architect in particular, Yasmina, and her husband. Um, and a few other people. I mean, oh, a, a little teaser, you know. The the moment we actually got the license, the lady, uh, the lovely lady in the local tourism office in Chakovets in the in the um, in the uh, Županja, um, she cried, and she cried because she was just so passionate about helping us do this thing that no one else had ever done before, and because they'd never done it before, they didn't know how to deal with us. But her her um, she was so invested that when we finally got the the license she literally just cried because it was so emotional for her so you know when you've got that level of support around you um you can be flying by the seat of your pants but you can get there thanks for listening to our podcast if you would like to support us and the production of future episodes then please consider maybe giving us a tip or becoming a member of our podcast family the link to do that is in the show notes for this podcast Thanks again for listening. We really do appreciate it.